that was great. I could just pronounce the benediction and go home <laughs> rejoicing in that theme, but we'll not do that. Luke 22, the 22nd chapter of the Gospel of Luke. Christian sometimes is the most misunderstood creature on God's earth. The world cannot fathom the victory we have already in Christ. They have no comprehension of what is already ours through the Son of God. If they had more of a comprehension of it, they might be more swift to consider the Lord Jesus and to cry out for his mercy. May the Lord reveal more and more in these days to men his love and his mercy and his victory through the cross and resurrection. We're going to read once again in this chapter, reading from verse 19, I'm going to do what I did this morning in terms of just pausing, uh, not pushing on. Last week in Hebrews 9, we, we sought to go as far as verse 14, but then this morning I, I just wanted to pause in verse 14 again and bring out a little more, sort of squeeze a little more out of the text. And I'm going to do the same this evening. We did not really give much attention to verses 28, 29, and 30. So I want to come back to encourage our own hearts in looking at those verses particularly. But let's see the context from verse 19. So follow along in God's Word. Remember, this is God's Word. He speaks through His living Word. We are to give our utmost attention to it. And he took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave on to them saying, This is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. Likewise also the cup after supper saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood which is shed for you. But behold, the hand of him that betrayeth me is with me on the table. And truly the Son of Man goeth as it was determined. But woe unto that man by whom he is betrayed. And they began to inquire among themselves which of them it was that should do this thing. And there was also a strife among them, which of them should be accounted the greatest. And he said unto them, The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them. And they that exercise authority upon them are called benefactors. But ye shall not be so. But he that is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he that is chief, as he that doth serve. For whether is greater, he that sitteth at meat, or he that serveth, is not he that sitteth at meat, but I am among you, as he that serveth. Hear they which have continued with me in my temptations, and I appoint unto you a kingdom, as my Father hath appointed unto me, that ye may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, sit on thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. We'll end the reading there at the 30th verse. Trusting the Lord will write His Word on our hearts. This is the Word of God. Receive it as such. Believe it as the very Word of God and entrust your souls that it is God's Word to you. And the people of God said, Amen. Let's pray. Lord, give us submission to Thy truth. Whatever success we may have in this life, it cannot compare to successfully receiving thy word. And yet we know that the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. They are foolishness unto him. So we pray for the ministry of the Spirit. Blessed Spirit of God, Upon the merit of Christ, we seek thy ministry here. 
we would see Jesus and we would seek to understand the mind of the one who loves us and has given himself a ransom for many, even for us. Bless us here tonight. Again, please come and draw near. We think of thy word already declared today, the ministry there in the senior home. We pray, God, that you would be pleased to save, have mercy upon those who heard the word. Let them be greatly alarmed if they are without Christ and draw them with cords of love to thyself and be with us here and do the same also. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. The more I have looked at this scene and considered it over the past number of weeks, the more I have found this particular occasion in which the Lord is with his disciples in what is described as an upper room for the purpose of Passover and the institution of the Lord's Supper, the more I have contemplated it, I have found it so rewarding to my own soul. Christ meets with his disciples and instructs them in many different aspects of the Christian life and different details come to the fore as he does so, not just in the words that he speaks, but also in the whole conduct of our Lord as he addresses them. To those of us who are here tonight, let us never forget that as bread tastes best to the hungry, so Christ tastes best to the sinner. We should never be afraid of the fact that we are still sinful. I mean, we should lament it, but this is what we are here. And we are not called in this world to put on a facade and pretend we're something we're not. We're sinners. And as I've read over this passage, that is what has come to the fore, that these men despite the fact they have spent this time with the Lord Jesus Christ, the fact that they're still coming up short is, is there on the surface. And the Lord is so gracious to them, so patient with them. Does he expose their sins? Yes, he does. But he does so with the greatest tenderness. Even the wicked apostasy of Judas, Christ shows a certain tenderness. He doesn't unleash all that Judas deserves. That day will come time when Christ judges with an exactness to punish the sinner will come. But here he shows tremendous patience and tenderness. I think we should keep that in mind as we, in our moving through the world, will come across Judas Iscariots, those who are unfaithful, even though they may have been in the church, they're unfaithful. And yet there's a patience here in Christ that I think we should take on board. It has just been of tremendous pastoral encouragement and instruction to my own heart to think about this. Luke pulls together these themes around this occasion. The different facets of men then come to the fore. The betrayal of men, the humility of men, as well as the pride of men and the self-assurance of men, all these things and more. And it's going to continue when we come to verse 31. We're going to see the, the leader of the group, Peter, come to the fore full of self-assurance, and yet he is absolutely dependent upon a mediator to pray for him. In fact, they all are. That's the language as we shall see. The Lord is directing it to all of his disciples, their need for his mediation as Satan comes desiring to sift them as wheat, but he prays for them that their faith fail not. It's of course again in the context of one who is proving himself to be the betrayer. Now, last week, as we saw from these verses, verses 21 through 30, we saw in this included the, not just the humility of them, where they begin to inquire, which it should be that should betray the Lord. We, we saw that. That's commendable. There's a right spirit that they reflect there. But immediately then, we are told of the strife in verse 24 and following, where they begin to wonder which of them should be accounted the greatest. And we said a few things regarding that, but as I thought about it more, there's, there's so much here. So much as you think about it. I mean, I don't know what gave rise to this. It may have been actually them walking into the, the very space and then wondering what the seating arrangements might be. Because again, the Lord uses that as the example. Verse 27, whether is greater he that sitteth at meat or he that serveth. 
So, so that's the context. They're sitting and eating together, and there may have been this discussion, you know, who's greatest? How should we order our, our seating arrangement here tonight? And of course, you know, there would be a certain custom, but the Lord then teaches that he, he reverses that, that it's not about greatness as far as his kingdom is concerned, how men esteem greatness, but the greatest is the one who serves and shows humility. And I wonder then, did that, did that control how they sat? Because when you read John 13, I was just thinking about this, when you read John 13, we know then that Peter is far enough away from Jesus that he has to get John to ask the question about what he's talking about on that occasion. But I just wondered, is that how they then arranged things? Peter sort of said, well, if that's the case, I'll sit far away. John, you're younger. You go and sit next to the Lord and try and go order. I, I don't know. I don't know. You try to put yourself there and wonder how the words of the Lord immediately affect. Because we know when it comes to Peter, at least, when Jesus says something and he realizes it, he acts immediately. He doesn't hesitate. We, we see this over and over and over again, this impulse in Peter to respond immediately. And we, again... Whenever they all forsake him, the, the thousands leave the Lord Jesus, it's Peter that steps up and says, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. Later on, after the resurrection, when John spies it is the Lord, Peter doesn't hesitate. He jumps into the water and swims there to see him. He's always acting immediately. And I wonder then, did this discussion here unfold around the seating arrangement of that occasion? We've said before that Luke doesn't always put things in immediate chronological order, he arranges them as themes. And it may have been, even as they entered into this space, this is what gave rise to who's the greatest. But as I say, the Lord shows them the paradox of servile leadership and seeks to, inst seeks to instruct them on the right frame of mind that is so, so helpful. We are not to think ourselves above the problems that arose in the Bible, and especially in the epistles as you read through them. And what comes to mind, there are a number. We could talk of the Corinthian church and the division that's there about the partisan, I'm a Peter, I'm a Paul, and so on and so forth. As well as the Philippian church, in which that tremendous church that brought such joy to Paul had an issue of division among them that was caused by pride. There was pride. And that pride gave rise to contention. And so the example set forth in Philippians 2 is, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. This is something we need to be told over and over again. That's why I say to you, when you sit here, or you, rather you, you try to sit with the disciples and the Lord Jesus in the scene, there's so much instruction for us. But Christ wants his people to serve in humility and harmony. And the Lord of glory was the servant of servants, and yet we, so far short, are prone to a pride and a sense of entitlement. Reading this, this passage and, and considering the instruction the Lord gives in terms of his own example, I am among you as he that serveth. I ask myself, if Christ had my gifts and limitations would he be doing what I am doing? And I think that question could be applied to every believer. Obviously, Christ, as a Messiah, had his role and his calling and was gifted to that end. But ask yourself, since we are all to follow in his footsteps and be molded after him and like unto him, and as far as the Spirit of God will enable us, if he had my gifting as well as my limitations. Would he be doing what I'm doing? And you ponder that. You start asking, is, is that, am I fulfilling what I'm meant to be doing? Am I really being the hands and feet of Christ according to what he would have me do? And I just leave that with you for your encouragement. As we look at verses 28 through 30, I've titled this simply, Persevering, Suffering, and Reigning with Christ. Persevering, suffering and reigning with Christ. This, there, there's a whole theology of this. And I'm going to look at the text, but you, you could actually go through the Bible and see this theme come, come out of the Scripture over and over and over and over and over again. Persevering, suffering, and reigning with Christ. You look at the patriarchs, you find them going through that. 
They are called to perseverance. Abraham's given a promise. He holds on to that promise. Time goes by. He has to persevere and keep persevering. There are hiccups along the way. His wife gets involved, encourages him to go and have a child to Hagar and so on and so forth. But there's this, there's this need to persevere, to suffer before you reign. And there's not one of us claiming to know Christ that can avoid this path. And this is what we have then before us. I trust it will be of help as we consider it. First, persevering with Christ. Verse 28. Ye are they, speaking to the disciples, ye are they which have continued with me. Ye are they which have continued with me. This brings to the fore the doctrine of perseverance. The perseverance of the saints. It's a sweet, precious doctrine in the word of God. Where we expect everyone who belongs to Jesus Christ will persevere to the end. That none can be plucked out of his hand. We are secure in his embrace. And having set his love upon us, he is not going to relinquish that love, change his mind, or leave us destitute without his mercy. Once we are in Christ, we are in Christ. As we said from Hebrews 9, and what it says in Hebrews 9, that he obtained eternal redemption. And your enjoyment of redemption is an eternal enjoyment. And yet what we see in the world is not that. What we see in the world are those that at times drop off. Who walk away. Who fail to continue with Jesus. And we ask why? Our confession, which I, so often I use it in my sermons, I, I want, encourage you to Acquaint yourself with its language. It is concise, packed, full of meat for your soul for you to ponder. And you can read it and you can check the scripture references and find yourself greatly shaped and helped by its language. And it deals with this doctrine, the perseverance of the saints. In the Confession, chapter 17, and I'm going to read the three paragraphs given to us. And I'm going to read it slowly. I want you to hear what... The divines put before us how they concisely summarize this doctrine where Christ is highlighting to his disciples, ye are they which have continued with me. Why? Why? The confession says, they whom God hath accepted in his beloved, effectually called and sanctified by his spirit, can neither totally nor finally fall away from the state of grace, but shall certainly persevere therein to the end and be eternally saved. That's absolute. Absolute. Now, if you're younger or you're new, there are words in there you need to explore. I don't have time to expound on the confession. That's not my purpose tonight. So I encourage you, go and read it. Ask yourself, ask a friend, what does this word mean? What does it mean effectually called? What does that mean? And you'll find you'll be greatly enriched. But the second paragraph, this perseverance of the saints depends not upon their own free will, but upon the immutability of the decree of election flowing from the free and unchangeable love of God the Father upon the efficacy of the merit and intercession of Christ, the abiding of the Spirit and of the seed of God within them and the nature of the covenant of grace from all which ariseth also the certainty and infallibility thereof. So it's not you. Perseverance is not your work. It is God's. And we'll see that from the Bible in just a moment. Then the third paragraph. Here's where we see what we actually see in the world. Nevertheless, they may, through the temptations of Satan and of the world, the prevalency of corruption remaining in them, and the neglect of the means of their preservation, fall into grievous sins. And for a time continue therein, whereby... 
they incur God's displeasure and grieve His Holy Spirit, come to be deprived of some measure of their graces and comforts, have their hearts hardened and their consciences wounded, hurt and scandalize others, and bring temporal judgments upon themselves. We see that, don't we? We don't always persevere in a perfect, consistent manner walking with Christ. We don't. Our personal experience within our own hearts, as well as what we observe, is one in which the perseverance of the saints does not manifest in this perfect, linear, upward movement towards glory. That's not how we experience it. We are so tested, so tried, so pushed and pressed upon that at times our wounds by the world, the flesh, and the devil are such that we limp or we fall back. And we experience backsliding, we experience despair and depression, we experience even times I have known believers who have walked away from the church. I mean, that's, that's what it says. It speaks there of... Uh, neglect of the means of their preservation. What's that talking about? It's the gifts God has given to you. We say to you, children, you know, read your Bible. Young people, read your Bible. Everyone, read your Bible. This is means of your preservation, hearing from God, prayer as well, calling upon God, committing your day to Him, asking for forgiveness, seeking for His help and strength. These are the means given unto you, attending to this place, I, I, you don't have the greatest preacher in the world, but the word is read and it is preached and it is a means, right? It is a means. You can't, you can't get away from that. It is a means. Sunday, Wednesday, it is a means to preserve, to keep you in the right path. You never know that in a moment, in a particular time and season, when you're especially weak, that the occasion of the Lord's Day, even Wednesday nights, there may be a tonic, the perfect Medicine prescribed by your shepherd and the very doctor of your soul is going to say, this is what you need. And you'll find your whole heart lifted out of despair and into a state of encouragement. So these disciples, they had continued with Christ. They had continued with Christ. And that is good. That's what we want to model. In Galatians 6, well-known text, verse 8, Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Well, what is well-doing if it is not continuing with Christ? I mean, in its essence. Now, the apostle is dealing with specific acts of well-doing, doing the right thing, the, the outworking of our Christian faith and our words and deeds and so on. And that seems to be largely what is in his mind, but... At, at the foundation, what is well doing but persevering with Christ, continuing on with Christ. And this is what the disciples did. And again, it's put in this way, they've continued with him. But what did that mean? It, it meant certain things that they did, the, the carrying on, the, the faithful preaching. When he sent them out two by two to preach and teach and heal and so on, they went and they were faithful and they continued in that. And so we are called to the same. We are called to continue with the Lord Jesus Christ and we can become weary and well-doing. Weary and well-doing. Now you can get weary with things that are not well-doing. God never intended you to do that thing. You're getting weary with something. There's something you're engaging in. It's exhausting you and the Lord never intended you to do that in the first place. You have misdirected your, your energies and so on. But when it comes to well-doing, and this, I heard Reverend Wagner say this. I never really contemplated it in this way before. He spoke about what this text is talking about in Galatians 6 verse 8. But being weary and well-doing, what the Lord is, is asking of us is to continue in the very thing that has made us weary. And that the, the answer to our weariness in the well-doing is to continue to do the well-doing. Now, that is not what we naturally feel. If we're in a path and it's making us weary, even if it's well-doing, we might say, I need a break. I need a rest. I need to stop doing that. And I'm, I know you're going to say, well, does this mean there are no seasons for, for rest, for vacation? No, that's not the point. 
there's a place for coming aside and resting a while. That's not the point. But when we're getting weary to the point we're going to quit well-doing, we're contemplating quitting, quitting a ministry, quitting a marriage, quitting a job, quitting something else that God has called us to that is well-doing, it's providing for our family, it is our, the fulfillment of our vows as we stood before people and exchanged them in the presence of witnesses, well-doing is continuing in that path. And the way as we feel the weariness to deal with the weariness is to continue in the thing that we think is causing the weariness in the first place. Now that's hard. That's hard. Why do men give up the ministry? Why do missionaries come home prematurely? Why do people quit ministries of all sorts of things? Why, why, why do people go through this? Because it's hard. It's hard. We have a trinity that's constantly working against us, as we mentioned, the world, the flesh, and the devil, trying to stop us from continuing, pursuing a course of action that honors God. This is what the disciples had done. They had continued. We've all said it. We've all heard it. It's not how you start, it's how you finish. And we have seen many drop off along the way. Not all who profess continue. This church has seen it. It will continue to see it. If it doesn't, then we're going to be some kind of strange anomaly. Because it has always been, and it always will be, that people are a part of Christ and his people for a time. And then one day they're not. They're just not. What makes a difference then for you? How do you know you will continue like the disciples did here? Except Judas, of course. Here they which have continued with me. How do you know? Well, one of the best texts to dwell upon is found in Romans 8, 30th verse. And there we see why we continue on. Whom God did predestinate, them God also called. And whom God called, them God also justified. And whom God justified, them God also glorified. From predestination to glorification, the emphasis is on the work of God. It is God. He doesn't need our help. He's not depending on some characteristic in me that tends to be good at dealing with hardship and continuing on. We start saying, well, what's the difference between those that persevere and those who don't persevere? Well, they have a certain characteristic. They're, they're made of a certain kind of stock that, that they're de it's in their DNA to deal with hardship and carry on. That's, that's not it. It's not it. The reason you will persevere, the reason I will persevere, the reason any Christian perseveres is because God begins the work and he will complete the work. That's Philippians 1, 6. He which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. It is absolute. The continuance of these disciples rests entirely upon the grace of God, the support and mercy of Jesus Christ in the supply of what his shed blood brings. We stand in a covenant where we are blessed with this privilege that he is our God. We are his people. and So it shall ever be. There's no greater encouragement than this, that this Continuance is dependent upon God. It is dependent upon God. Now, again, there are means. We've been dealing with it through Hebrews. Because Hebrews is a sermon where it doesn't undermine the doctrine that God is the one who keeps, but it focuses upon means and it encourages, encourages those who are tempted to fall back, return to their old Jewish ways and practices without the Lord Jesus recognized as the Messiah, that the answer to that is 
looking onto Jesus. Looking onto Jesus. So you say, well, what, what am I to do then to make sure I persevere? Look on to Jesus. If, there, if there's something you have to do, it is looking on to Christ. But it's not so much something we do as it's something we must do as believers. Is not Christ our Lord and Savior and is not our delight Him and what He has accomplished? Are our lives not transformed by this knowledge that the Lord Jesus is ours? I mean, how can we take our eyes off Him? Can we live for days and weeks and months ignoring Him? Can we cast Him aside for years and then at our own will and discretion pick Him up again and look onto Him? No. The continuance of the believer is based on this magnetism to Christ that we must look to Jesus Christ. We can't help it. I think I've shared this with you before, but in dealing with a lady, a gentleman that I know I met in Australia, and dealing with a lady who was struggling with assurance, he spent much time trying to help her understand to no avail getting nowhere with her. When finally he said, why don't you forget about the whole thing? Just, just forget about it. Just, just stop reading your Bible, stop praying, stop attending the house of God, and just live your life. Forget about it. And she looked at him stunned. You know, that's the, that wasn't the counseling she came to receive. But she looked at him stunned and said, I could never do that. His response was, how come? People do it all the time. All of the time. They stop reading their Bibles. They stop praying. They stop going to church. They stop interacting with the people of God. They get a new group of friends that they interact with. New hobbies, new interests that fill up their time and their, exhaust their energies. So how come you can't? How come that is beyond comprehension to you that you could just cast him aside? Because despite her own struggles with assurance, she had this love for Christ. And she wanted to continue with him. Beloved, keep your eyes. The key to, keep, to continuing on in terms of how it looks in your life is looking on to Jesus Christ. Don't, don't, don't take your eyes off him for a second. When the whole world is falling apart, remember, remember Peter for all of his shortcomings and he's stepped out of the boat and walking on the water and he begins to see the, the waves and the storm and his heart is faint and he begins to sink in unbelief and he says, Lord, save me. Where is his gaze when he's sinking? That's where your gaze must be. So, perseverance. What a precious truth to know that it is God's work in us. We keep our eyes on Christ and He will sustain us in an endurance to the very end. Secondly, suffering with Christ. Suffering with Christ. Because verse 28 says, Ye are they which have continued with me in my temptations. In my temptations. I think sometimes we read the life of Christ and miss the extent of his sufferings. Now we know as he approaches the cross, that's very much something we're aware of. But leading up to it, in his ministry, when the narrative is focused on his words and his deeds, his miracles, his parables, and so on, we get only brief insight into his inner experience of sorrow as men railed upon him, rejected him, lied about him, spread gossip and untruths concerning him. We don't get much in the way of emphasis on that. And yet it's something to dwell upon. In my temptations, the disciples sought 
the disciples saw what the gospel accounts don't fully record. They saw this animosity. They felt it. They were very conscious, as we said last week, of the threat upon his life and their own. And so every night they would go and and be very aware of the, the burden of being the Messiah, being despised and rejected of men, and the the taxing nature of that animosity upon the frame of men. Some of you know something about this. When you have been in a particular employment where it feels like if it's not your boss, maybe people you're working with, there's, there's 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 a tension there, the relationships are not good, there's, there's just, it feels like you're constantly under scrutiny or attack, that people are wishing your fall, they're looking for opportunity to fire you. You, you may have faced something like that, something akin to that, and, and, and just how draining it is five days a week or whatever to go in and face that, to, to like be in that environment, a sense of desperation, like it just, it's just wondering what it will be today. something of what the Lord faced and what the disciples faced with him. The American theologian B.B. Warfield has a short work titled The Emotional Life of Our Lord. It's worth reading because it's it's not very long. It's it's really quite short, but he he deals with the the little window we have into the the inner life of Christ. If you like, the, the kind of that which we see on greater display to a wider spectrum in the Psalms. That spectrum of human emotion between grief and sorrow. In one paragraph, Warfield observes, Joy he had, but it was not the shallow joy of mere pagan delight in living, nor the delusive joy of a hope destined to failure, but the deep exaltation of a conqueror setting captives free. This joy underlay all his sufferings and shed its light along the whole thorn-beset path which was trodden by his torn feet. We hear but little of it. However, as we hear but little of his sorrows, the narratives are not given to descriptions of the mental states of the great actor whose work they illustrate. We hear just enough of it to assure us of its presence underlying and giving its color to all his life, end quote. Just enough. It's not the focus. It's his words and his deeds, but we get this little insight into, I think, what's encapsulated in this language of them continuing with me in my temptations, in my temptations, and all the sorrow and the burden that he felt and experienced this little window. But these disciples had seen it up close and personal. And they had felt it as they attached themselves to him. They felt the onslaught, the identity with Jesus Christ brought it no doubt their way at times. It certainly caused them to fear for their own lives. But they continued with him in his temptations. Our Lord Jesus delights in this. He delights in it because his path on this earth was one of suffering. He is the man of sorrows acquainted with grief. They had to endure this. And as we have noted, he is is continuing in this path, setting his face as a flint to go to Jerusalem. That is, this, this resolve to go to the cross. He must and he will. And his disciples join in. And they stay with him through all of that. And he delights in this. He delights in disciples willing to suffer. Don't get me wrong. He doesn't delight in the suffering in the sense that he has some kind of weird pleasure out of suffering. But he delights in their willingness to suffer with him and for him. He delights in it. Saul of Tarsus, at his conversion when Ananias is sent to go on speak to him and address him. In Acts 9, 15, Ananias is told, go thy way, for he, this is Saul, later Paul, 
Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel, for I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Saul's conversion rattled the kingdom of darkness. He was an emissary of Satan, chief among those seeking to destroy the church, and in a moment he changes camps. And Christ takes him out of Satan's grasp and puts him in his own army to become a warrior for him. And it rattled the kingdom of darkness. Now we know this. We have this little insight in Acts 19 when the, the evil spirit cries out, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? And we, we see something of how Paul was, was known. He was known. Because once he was this, at the pinnacle of all that Satan was trying to achieve in the destruction of the people of God. And then he becomes the pinnacle of one expanding the kingdom of Christ and gathering in Jew and Gentile by the preaching of the gospel. And he was known because he rattled the very foundation of the kingdom of darkness. But in doing so, in doing so it was not without tremendous suffering. And this man who is going to become key to the, the launching of the gospel into the far regions of the world, the man to whom, under God, we ourselves owe a great debt because of the direction he went and where he proclaimed the gospel. Because he came westward to where most of us, in terms of our lineage and so on, come from. And we owe a debt to this life, but this life, in terms of its fruitfulness, required, necessitated, Experience continually suffering. Suffering. Now we're averse to it. And naturally so. Naturally so. There's no joy in suffering. We don't delight in it. We don't wish it on ourselves. And yet this is what God has set up for his people time and time and time again. That we be with him in his temptations. That just as they were with him in his life and his temptations, so there's ongoing trial for all the church in all ages. And we as members of his body must participate in the suffering. The body of which we are a part is marked by wounds. And those wounds weren't a one-time thing in terms of his crucifixion. In a sense, they continue on with the wounds afflicted upon the people of God who are members of his body. Go to Philippians 3. Turned here recently. I think it was in the, in the prayer meeting on Wednesday. Dealing with Paul's delight in the righteousness that he received by faith in Jesus Christ. And Philippians 3, reading from verse 9, where he desires to be found in Christ, not having mine own righteousness which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. What is he saying? That his, in his pursuit of knowing Christ, he is not under any illusion as to what that will entail. The power of his resurrection, that's the, the, the principle of life that energizes the people of God, that keeps them going on. But it's also the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. That is identifying, experiencing, understanding what he went through, if by any means. That is with a sense of assurance. There's no doubt here. The if is not one of questioning, but as one who is with Christ and in Christ, he will attain unto the resurrection of the dead. The idea is, if I am going to be raised to reign with Christ, this is the path. The 
fellowship of his sufferings. Calvin on this passage says, having spoken of that freely conferred righteousness which was procured for us through the resurrection of Christ and is obtained by us through faith, he proceeds to treat of the exercises of the pious and that in order that it might not seem as though he introduced an inactive faith which produces no effects in the life. So he's going on from justification by faith alone, moving into what that will mean for those in Christ. He continues, we must all therefore be prepared for this, that our whole life shall represent nothing else than the image of death until it produce death itself as the life of Christ is nothing else than a prelude of death. We enjoy, however, in the meantime, this consolation that the end is everlasting blessedness. But the death of Christ is, I think that's the end of the quote. I think I've got to put a end of the quotation mark there. But you get the sense of it. Our whole life shall represent nothing else than the image of death until it produced death itself, as the life of Christ is nothing else than a prelude of death. We have the consolation of blessedness to come. I know there's a part of your being and mine that winces at the idea of suffering. But beloved, you need to contemplate and study this because this is inescapable. It is inescapable. You are going to suffer and the world is going to see it. There'll be times of suffering that are very private. You have to endure that and experience that and trust Christ through it. And there are other times that are very public. In both instances, Christ is being glorified. He is being glorified through your continuance with him in the temptations. We don't know to what end always he is doing what he is doing. But dear suffering saint, make friends with your providence. It is a friend to help you. Otherwise your father would not have appointed it. Oh, to have that mentality like Peter and John when they were beaten and to suffer and told not to preach Christ anymore and they went away rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer for their Savior. Maybe, maybe you think that well that makes sense. They're suffering in terms of the preaching of the gospel but go, go and read the apostle, go and read the apostle's life and his testimony. Don't ask yourself if if every suffering was directly connected to, in terms of actual direct connection to someone persecuting him for actual preaching, it wasn't. Some of his sufferings were, were, were through his, his travels and all sorts of other experiences that he went through. It was appointed unto him. Finally, reigning with Christ. Reigning with Christ. Going back to the passage, we are told in verse 29, I appoint unto you a kingdom. I appoint. There's a sense of, of guarantee there, covenantal guarantee. I appoint unto you a kingdom, as my Father hath appointed unto me. There's a quality here. I've been appointed a kingdom, and so have you, that ye may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. So we touched on this last week. We made mention of the fact that there may be here, directly in terms of the apostles, a sense of them judicially proclaiming the mind of Christ to them for having rejected their Messiah. And in that way, they directly judged the 12 tribes. That may be included. But there may be more. That may, of course, look to a future time as well. Certainly, that is something which is to come. I'm not sure if it may even have something to do with, with Psalm 122. I'll read it to you. In Psalm 122, it speaks of, of thrones of judgment and the thrones of the house of David. Whether the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, unto the testament of Israel to give thanks unto the name of the Lord. For there are set thrones of judgment, the thrones of the house of David. And there may be a sense of that, those that God sends to go and judge in that way. 
It may also allude to Daniel 7. In Daniel 7, you see there that the bestowal of the kingdom upon the Son of Man and his saints being with him. But whatever this means, it is, it is never far away from a sense of the, the themes of what we've been dealing with. Perseverance and suffering before reigning. And it comes out over and over and over again. And I think that's what we should take away from this. Go to Revelation. Paul tells Timothy that if we suffer with him, we should also reign with him. So we see it in that text as well. But I, I want you to see something here from Revelation 2. And there are a number of the letters to the churches that would, that would serve our purpose here, but Thyatira is where I want to read. We'll, we'll take time just to read from verse 24. Don't want to go on too long here. Verse 24, Revelation 2, 24. But unto you I say, and unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine and which have not known the depths of Satan as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden, but that which ye have already, hold fast till I come. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my Father. And I will give him the morning star. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. You see in verse 27, verse 26 and 27, that the one who overcomes and keeps his works, what is that? What is that but, but persevering and suffering? What happens? They are given authority, power over the nations to rule. Even as I received of my Father. Is there not a connection there between that and what we read in Luke 22. Now again, keep the context in mind of, of these letters. These letters are not written for us to draw up eschatological charts and try to determine which epoch that we are in in terms of the church, right? So, oh, we're in the, 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 the era of the, the Laodiceans because we're rich and increased with goods and have needed nothing. It's, it's always bizarre to me that people can actually talk that way as if, as if America represents the entire world, right? And the, the entire church is rich and increased with goods and has need of nothing, when the reality is most Christians on this planet have next to nothing, right? Most of them. If we're going to look at China where there's hundreds of millions, we're led to believe, Christians, hundreds of millions, right? Enough Christians that, that might actually be sufficient to populate the current population of America, just Christians over there. And they probably, for the most part, have next to nothing. So we're not, we don't look at it that way. These are letters written in that time, in that first century, to address the people who are experiencing the increasing rise of persecution. And the entire book of Revelation is given to put backbone into believers that they might continue to the end. And one of the motivations that Christ gives he, he doesn't shy away from the fact that there's going to be overcoming, which, which implies friction, doesn't it, to overcome? It implies friction. It implies difficulty. You can't overcome unless there's something to overcome. And so believers are faced with trial, with persecution, with suffering, with death, with hardship, with poverty, with anger and hatred of this world. They're faced with that. But they're encouraged to overcome and keep his works to the end. That is continue. See, keep my works. That's continue with me, isn't it? It's like our text, isn't it? Here they which continue with me. Here you have it. In terms of Christ writing to this church, saying the same thing, keeping his works on to the end, and they will be given authority over the nations. I'm not about to enter into what that means. The, past, the scripture seems to 
gives strong evidence that largely speaking, the reign of believers is, is future. Now, there's a time when we will reign with him in actuality in a certain expression. I don't know all the details, but if you study it, you'll see that there definitely is a future bent to this. Now, I think there, there's a sense in which we should see what is already ours and be encouraged with it as we live. That there's no doubt that you're going to reign with Christ. And when you read the epistles, Ephesians comes to mind, that we're currently reigning with him. There's a sense in which there's an already not yet. As so often is the case in terms of our Christian experience. Some things we have, but not in the full expression. And there's a not yet that we're still to enjoy. And so we are reigning. So when you, you go into this world and you're, you're fearful of men, why be fearful? You're the one reigning with Christ. Why be fearful? And this gives strength to overcome because we are on the victor's side. We have the guarantee of victory and we, we, we're not in doubt of this. And so there's coming a time when he will then take those who overcome and keep his works and they will, they will reign with him. In other words, the Lord is guaranteeing reward for the suffering. Reward for the suffering. It will not be in vain. Beloved, that, that's, that's the Christian life. These three things we have looked at that are found in that text sum up the believer's life. And it has always been that way. Again, I say it. Go, go, go to Noah. Go, go to the patriarchs. Go to the children of Israel and read the judges and so on and so forth. Read whoever you wish. Look at, look, at, look at David, for example. There is this persevering. There is this suffering before he reigns. That's the pattern. If you shy away from it, if you're unwilling to accept that that is the path your father will chart for you, speaking in generalities, I don't know the specifics, but that's the path. If you're unwilling to embrace that, you will fall away. And this, the passage of the scripture is littered with constant reminders that this is the way. There's no avoiding it. And so the summary of the apostolic instruction to churches that you have at the end of Acts 14 is that we must, through much tribulation, enter the kingdom of God. Much tribulation. Okay, America is not persecuting Christians to the degree as is experienced in other places, but God's not going to let you go without suffering. You have to walk something of the path your Savior walked. You have to appreciate something of what he endured. You have to feel the weight of the curse and the, the pressure of a world that's at enmity with the people of God. You have to feel it some way. He's going to order it lovingly. Not, not to discourage but to open up little fresh glimpses of your Savior planting seeds of greater appreciation for who He is and what He has done are you? May the Lord help us. Let's bow together in prayer. As we bow before the Lord, let me address the young people especially. Young person, just before we close here, Satan knows that you are in a vulnerable season. He knows it. If you are 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, you're in that age, college age, leading up to college. He knows. He is a master of timing. And just as you're starting to get acquainted with a sense of autonomy, 
He is going to feed into your mind. Don't serve Jesus. Do what feels good. Do what you want. Don't bother going to church twice. And going to the prayer meeting. Why would you do that? And his goal is to destroy your soul. Lord, we pray, please keep our eyes fixed upon thee. Give us. Give us a sense, even as we proceed in this passage. See your own weakness. And that our confidence lies in the one who prays for us. That our faith fail not. We depend upon thee, Lord. Remember thy suffering saints here. Thy suffering saints online. Give thy people such bounteous grace that they may find a way to appreciate the fellowship of Christ's sufferings. Lift up our children, our young people, knowing that some are entering a very critical few years. May thy mighty hand so powerfully rest upon them that they will not faint or grow weary. Hear our prayers. Bless our fellowship. Strengthen us for the week that lies ahead. May the grace of the Lord Jesus, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Spirit be with all the blood-bought people of God now and evermore. Amen.